Every time the phone rings, it's bad news. It's usually BBC asking me to comment on something horrible that has happened in the Muslim world. And this has been the situation for me for the last 10, 12 years. And so I have been through similar seminars multiple hundreds of times. And I can tell you each time that it's not going to get better overnight. Unfortunately, things are going to get worse before they get better. And, and that is why it's very important for all of us to, to anticipate how bad it can get and try to preempt the badness or the evil that is going to increase. To give you an example, in the, in the United States still we are shielded from the challenges that the Muslim world and Europe faces. We have been at war perpetually since 2001, October. But it doesn't feel like war. No bombs have dropped in Delaware. We continue. Tennis clubs are on, football games are on. Our life continues as it did before the war started. We are protected from the consequences of war, but the nations that we have gone to war against are not. If you're living in some country that we are at war for, when you go to work, you could come back and find that your house does not exist. Your entire family got wiped out because the drone got it wrong. So one thing that we live in the United States, we are shielded from the realities which are very harsh of these ongoing so-called clash of civilizations. In Europe, it's much more real. Uh, in the United States, the Muslim presence is extremely insignificant. We are less than 1%. We don't threaten. But in Europe, Muslims are not only the religious other, the ethnic other, but also the racial other. Muslims are, to Europe, what African Americans are here, a racial minority that is marginalized, oppressed. What happened in Ferguson is not very different from what happened in Paris. People talk about these two gentlemen who walked into Charlie Hebdo and killed them as if they are only Muslims. No, they're not Muslims, they are French. They were born in France, they grew up in France, they live all their lives in France, and I guarantee you that the best language that they speak is French. They are products of French society. And France will not take credit for these people. Last year I was at a conference in Berlin called Progressive Muslims. And some members of the parliament showed me a video of an 18-year-old German who had converted to Islam and was creating a no they're creating a Sharia zone in Berlin where he was trying to force Islamic law on women. They had to wear hijab or he would use violence. And at the end of it, they turn and say, what do you say, Dr. Khan? I said, what's this got to do with me? He's German, born in Germany, product of German schools. He rejects your great culture. This is what this German kid did. He rejected the great enlightened European culture of Germany the land of Nietzsche and Hegel and Kant, and embrace perhaps one of the worst products of the Muslim world, that is the Taliban. I said, you need to worry about your own society and culture as to why are these young people growing up in your societies rejecting your enlightenment to embrace the jahiliya of the Muslim world. What is it that you're doing to this kid? That he wants to be like the Taliban. I mean, what has that got to do with me? Like this Jihad Jane from Philadelphia. She never met a Muslim and she wanted to become a jihadi. So what did America do to her? That she did this. This is a serious question which no one seems to ask. It's not about Islam. I'm a Muslim too. And there are lots of Muslims here who would never even think of doing what happened in Charlie Hebdo. The question that we are not asking is this is a very serious question that this so-called clash is making both sides become exactly like the worst of the other. You understand? Both sides are becoming like the worst manifestation of the other. The French came out in large numbers, nearly three million of them, and affirmed the right to freedom of speech, and then the next day they behaved as if they were Egypt. You know, lock up people for posting Facebook statuses. I mean, what kind of country are you that people cannot even express? <clears throat> Whether it is a serious comment or whether it is a comical statement. 
And the most ironic aspect of it was the person who was arrested was a comedian. So his one statement, Facebook satire, was not acceptable to France, but they would accept Muslims to embrace. There are two or three things that Muslims find it extremely difficult to bear. Insults to God, insults to Prophet, insults to their holy book. This is the holy trinity of Muslims, don't, don't touch it. You want to make fun? Make fun of Egypt, make fun of Saudi Arabia, we do it all the time. You have 55 Muslim countries, make fun of them. Do, make fun of Muslims in Delaware, that's fine. But this whole idea that this is our values, where we vilify your sacred symbols. But the problem with that is when we are not consistent across the board. When we're not consistent across the board and people are arrested for all kinds of speech acts, which should have been covered by simple legislation to protect freedom of speech. So this hypocrisy on both sides, like Muslims talk about Islam is a religion of peace and Prophet ﷺ was sent as mercy to humanity and then they go and shoot people and say, I did this for the sake of the Prophet. There are some Muslims who are doing that, we cannot deny that. That's why I like to share. Uh, Shadid's statement that there are, there are many Islams out there, many kinds of Muslims out there. We can't paint everybody with a broad brush, as we cannot say that all Western countries are hypocritical when it comes to freedom of speech. There's a huge difference between the United States and the rest of European countries, for example. What we need to do is we need to go beyond the sensationalism of the media and focus on these issues in a much more serious way because it's going to, it's going to affect all of us, whether you like it or not. It's going to affect all, all of us. In, in many ways, uh, our children interact together. Uh, Islam has become a source of trauma for Europeans for the last thousand years. And what is more traumatic for Europe is that that thing that they despised and hated is now part of them. I had a very interesting dialogue with French intellectuals a few years ago. And they were constantly complaining about how Muslims are not assimilating in France. And while I was sitting there, you know, we Sufis get ilham. We are friends of God, not chosen people. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I was sitting there and I got this inside. I said, oh my God, it's not Muslims who can't assimilate in France. It is the French intellectuals who have a problem in assimilating in the new France. They can't assimilate in the France where Islam is the second biggest religion. Try finding directions in Paris. They will tell you in English that we don't speak English. <laughs> really? It's impossible to get directions in Paris. So we went there as a family in 2004. I went back there in 2006 trying to find places in Paris and they would tell me in English. I don't speak English. Maybe that's the only sentence they know in English. Now, Alhamdulillah, I don't have to do anything. Now I speak Arabic. So I just look around and ask the question in Arabic and the person will say, don't worry, I will show you where it is. So he leaves whatever he's doing and walks me there. Because Islam and Muslims are all over. If you go to Belgium, there are 105 mosques in Belgium alone. So the presence, this significant presence of Islam and Muslims has created this existential fear among Europeans that their culture, their identity is finished. And so they are reacting from that position of fear. So their reaction is against Islam and Muslims and their assertiveness. This invocation that this is freedom of speech really is not about that. If the French believed in freedom of speech and freedom of religion, then you wouldn't see laws such as the banning of hijab and banning of burqas and banning of, uh, of and mocking the prophets, constantly provoking the radicals. The whole idea is that you provoke an extremist to do something else, then paint everybody else as an extremist, and then new laws are made which will be anti-immigration, etc., etc. So the question that Western society and Muslim societies have to ask, there's one other problem that Muslims have to realize, that there are really lots of crazy people in our societies. We have wasted a, a, an opportunity that comes once in a century. The Arab Spring has been wasted. The Arab society has suffered for nearly 100 years, and now the, the hope that God gave them, they lost it. And if you don't acknowledge that there is a genuine problem there, let me tell you, the biggest victims of Muslim extremism are Muslims. 
If you make a list of who the Taliban kill most, who al Qaeda kill most, who Boko Haram and who ISIS kill most, they are Muslims. Literally 95 to 99% of their victims are Muslims. We cannot deny that. We have to embrace them. And therefore, we need to have two serious conversations. One, a conversation between Muslims and the West, where we go beyond hypocritical slogans and acknowledge that we are both at fault. And also acknowledge that we have a shared future and we need to do things together. The second thing is that Muslims need to have a dialogue too, where we need to acknowledge that we have a problem of extremism. And if we don't deal with that problem of extremism, it is going to hurt us. Americans have problems too, like the Tea Party and all. We have issues of extremism which are not really crazy at that level yet. We need to challenge that extremism. So it's very important that all of us who care for, for the future of our societies to kind of focus on these issues. And, uh, and I have further bad news for you that it's not going to go away in the next one year, two years, or three years. It's a generational challenge. This is the jihad of this generation, to combat extremism on both sides. If we succumb to Islamophobia in the West, it will generate more anti-Westernism in the Muslim world. These are two sides of the coin, they cannot go. If Muslims want to see Islamophobia subside, then we have to combat our own radicalism. If the West wants to see radicalism subside, then they have to combat their own Islamophobia.